Living Power with Dan Hurd. Very little is actually known about Nehemiah. Very little is known about this uh, man who wrote this book, an account of something that he did over uh, a period of, a short period of time, didn't take a whole lot of time to do it, but he literally transformed a ministry, transformed a city, transformed a people, and launched an entire nation into a, a resurgence. Uh, his name means Consoler of the Lord, which is kind of an interesting name, Consoler of the Lord. And uh, I'm not sure what, where that name came from or why he was given that name, but uh, we don't really know a whole lot about him as an individual. Now, there's some rabbinic teachings that say that he was from the lineage of Aaron, so that he was a legitimate uh, Judaic priest. He is generally identified, in fact, he says of himself that he was a cupbearer, uh, which basically was a butler, uh, which was considered a position of great influence, and that was back in Persia. And we'll take a look at a little of that history here in just a moment. There has been some, uh, some people said, well, no, that he was, he was a, a eunuch. The word, believe it or not, for cupbearer and eunuch are so close. They are simple. They're just one or two letters apart. And, uh, but it doesn't fit with some of the other things that he says and some of the things that he did that uh, eunuchs were not allowed to do, particularly as, as priests and particularly as leaders and certainly as in, uh, in their service to the king. So, more than likely, he was a cupbearer. Uh, he was the son of, of uh, Hakaliah, is, is how you say his name. We'll see that in a moment as we read the scripture. But Hakaliah was his father. And right at the very beginning, Nehemiah identifies himself as, as part of that family line. That leads us to believe that there may have been some confusion uh, over who Nehemiah really was. Apparently, Nehemiah was a very, very popular name. For example, in Nehemiah 3.16, someone else is identified as Nehemiah, son of Asbuk. So there were a, a number of different Nehemiahs in, 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 uh, in the books of Nehemiah and Ezra. They both refer to a Nehemiah who was with Zerubbabel. And uh, we'll take a look at what, what that was all about in just a moment. But uh, it wasn't the same Nehemiah. It's just said there was a Nehemiah with Zerubbabel. And if you're reading the name, assuming it's the same Nehemiah, you'll get really confused. But Nehemiah says, no, I am the Nehemiah that is the, uh, the son of Hakaliah. Uh, in any case, it was interesting that he identified himself that way because it also says that Hakaliah was probably well known. When he says, I'm the son of Hakaliah, people went, oh, Hakaliah, we know him. Uh, and his name means whom Jehovah enlightens. Uh, uh, what a great name. How would you like it if your dad's name was whom, whom Jehovah enlightens? I thought my dad, for the longest time, I thought he was the dumbest man on earth. And so, you know, it wasn't until I started growing up I realized how smart he really is. But, you know, for a long time, you know, as I got smarter, he got dumber. You know, have you, have you figured that out with kids yet? It's, it usually happens right, you know, in the pre-teens or early teens, and it goes on until college. college. <laughs> then they start turning it around and realizing, wow. Things are, maybe you are whom Jehovah enlightens. So we can assume that Nehemiah had the credentials and the reputation, and it probably, uh, a lot of it was attributed to his father. Now the historical background is important to understand why and how the events of Nehemiah's story happened. In 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar rose to prominence as the king of what historically became known as the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Now there were, as you study all of these empires and these dynasties in this area, it can get very, very confusing. But in 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar, actually his father built the empire, Nebuchadnezzar uh, assumed it from his father. It was kind of a reconstruction of what was known as the Assyrian Empire. And this new empire, this Neo-Babylonian Empire, they didn't call it that, historians have called it that. This Neo-Babylonian Empire, uh, which united the Median and the Babylonian dynasties that, that were ruling the, the, those areas. And uh, so then Nebuchadnezzar expanded the kingdom to the east um, all the way to Egypt. And we have a, a, a map of that here. And you can see that, that 
that area, which is basically what we refer to as the Middle East, that area which surrounded the Dead Sea, which today would be known as Israel, and Jordan, and Syria, and Lebanon, and such, was considered prime territory because it was a crossroads for trade. And so all of these, these empires, as they passed hands from one to the other, they all wanted that area because it was such an important area for trade. It was a, a critical part for the for business. And so everybody wanted this land that was that was considered what now is considered Israel and uh, was considered such an important uh, part of their of their economy. So he had this land right around in here, and but over here is where Babylon is. That's where, where the capital was. And Nehemiah was in this little town called Susa. This is Ur, which where, where Abraham came from. So now you've got your bearings. Uh, this is this is this trade center. The, there were crossroads that came right down here like this to Egypt, and then they, they would come over from Italy and, and Greece and come down like this. And uh, nobody came up from here because there's there nothing there. But then from the from the uh, from the east, from the far east, they would come along like this and either go north or go south. So it was a it was a critical area for business, and everybody wanted that. So uh, this. Nebuchadnezzar invaded this area and Jerusalem was devastated and over a period of 70 years uh, the Hebrews were taken actually in three different times groups three different times were taken to work in construction projects that Nebuchadnezzar uh, and his following kings after he died the following kings were doing in the capital of Babylon and essentially what happened was during that 70 year period Jerusalem became a ghost town it was just devastated. Uh, it was uninhabitable. It was just lying in ruins. However, around the 6th century BC, uh, the first Persian Empire was also developing. So the, this Neo-Babylonian Empire was developing where it was. But there was a guy by the name of Cyrus the Great that was also coming into prominence. And he was building his empire. And he began to take over territories throughout the Middle East and Asia. And eventually, became the largest empire in the history of the world. You can see that map up there and see how much territory that covers. That is far, far larger than the United States. It's, it's, it's really larger than Russia. It's just, it was the largest empire. Now, to get an idea of, of where the empire, uh, how, how extended, let's look at the next map. Well, wait, 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 before you do that. See this area right here? This is, this is Israel right here. There is uh, uh, Jerusalem right there. We come back over this way. This is this area that's known as, uh, this is uh, Jordan. This would be Syria. There's Turkey. There's uh, uh, Iraq, Iran. Uh, Afghanistan's up there. Uh, over here is, uh, I mean, Afghanistan's over here. And uh, Pakistan. Okay, now look at, look at the, the today's map. And we'll, we'll that'll kind of give, oh, that really looks good, doesn't it? See everything there. <laughs> Anyway, back over here is Israel, there's Jordan, there's Syria, there's Iraq, there's Iran, there's Afghanistan, there's Pakistan. By the way, uh, bin Laden, when he was killed, was right there. So that kind of gives you an idea, give a perspective of that whole area. See, now this area from here um, to here, this is the, 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 the Babylonian Empire right about here to here. That was about, from here actually, that was about 800 miles. So that will kind of give you an idea of, of the, the territory that we're talking about. In 539 BC, Cyrus, who we call Cyrus the Great, invaded Babylon and conquered it. And one of the first acts that Cyrus did was to allow the Hebrew exiles to begin to return to their homes. It was actually, a very, it very, happened very quickly after, after he conquered uh, Babylon. And the reason for that is because Cyrus believed that if, the, one of the ways that he could maintain control over his vast territories was to keep the people as happy as politically possible. So he wanted them to return home and have their homeland and go build their temple and follow their religion and, and, and do their things. He wasn't opposed to that. He just wanted to make sure that they paid their taxes. So his, his, his idea was let them go back to their home. So he sent an initial group of these, of these captive Hebrews 
back to Jerusalem. There were just over 42,000 of them. They went back in this first return under the authority of this guy named Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel's job was to take them back and begin rebuilding the temple. And uh, the reason for that was because the temple was the center of their culture. And so Cyrus said, you go back and you build, build the temple because once you build the temple, then the Hebrews will want to go back. And so that's what they did. Now, during that time, we read a number of prophets that, when you start reading the pro prophets uh, in the Old Testament, there was Haggai existed during that time. He talked about this, what was going on during this first return. Ezra, certainly, and Ezra gives a historical account about what was going on. Um, Nehemiah was, was certainly in that group. There were a few others that were in, in there, kind of, you know, just um, in parts of it. But a lot of what happens in the prophecies in the Old Testament took place during this time period that we're talking about. So Zerubbabel begins to rebuild the, the, uh, the city, or the, uh, the temple, and, uh, and the idea was that eventually the Hebrews would then want to come back to their homeland. And that story is told in the book of Ezra. In fact, uh, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah at one time were considered one scroll. It was just one scroll together. And uh, then later it was broken apart. And the book of Nehemiah, we'll actually see where Nehemiah brings Ezra back at some point uh, to read the Torah, uh, which was the law of Moses, to the people. So Ezra is in this first group that goes from Babylon back to, uh, the, to the homeland to rebuild the temple. And uh, for any number of reasons, things didn't go quite as planned with that first returned group. And uh, Jerusalem, uh, the temple was finally built, but it took some real doing. It was very complicated. They started building it, and they had to stop, and then they, they started building a little bit more, and then, some, then they got lazy, and then there were, a, there were a number of reasons why it didn't happen. But uh, it, when they found out that the temple was being built, but they didn't finish the complete project the way it was supposed to have been finished, it was a, a great concern and disappointment to the Hebrews who were still in captivity. And as a result, that would have also been a great concern to Cyrus, since he needed the inhabitants of that territory uh, to remain loyal to him and to be productive so that they could send back taxes, of course.